take the floor. Hello, Melanie. Bon après-midi à tout le monde. Eh bien, euh, to have our guests uh, as we are about to explore one other innovative, interesting, uh, emerging issue in relation to privacy. J'aimerais tout d'abord vous mettre en contexte. C'est le deuxième de ces événements. She, this is our second event, uh, which is uh, part of our Insight into Privacy uh, series. We decided to this, uh, use this series in order to uh, uh, talk about uh, what affects uh, and transform our social uh, sphere. Uh, and this is very important because information technology is having a great impact on uh, protection of privacy and our ability to exchange personal information. Oh, cool. with the privacy professionals as well as uh, with the Canadians at large, precisely to understand the social environment, the concept of privacy as it evolves. And uh, we are very mindful of how Facebook, Twitter or Foursquare can impact on our sense of privacy. Do we feel less private? Do we feel pressured to share? Do we feel invaded? Do we feel, on the other hand, uh, now uh, in uh, the ability to connect so much more and share so much more? Clearly, we need to rethink that space that we call privacy. And we couldn't have picked better guests than our guests today, Alessandra Quisti and Christina Nippert Ng. They will uh, precisely help us explore those new frontiers. It is part of our mandate to generate this kind of debate and to create public education events such as this one. I'm very glad, therefore, that we could host it and that we could greet you here today. Le but, c'est donc une compréhension. We want to further understand the questions uh, which pertain to our privacy and with no uh, further like, uh, to let Melanie speak. I'm uh, a manager in the research uh, branch at the OPC, and welcome again to our uh, speaker series. So uh, we're looking forward to an interesting conversation uh, with a sociologist and a behavioral economist to, uh, to uh, provide another perspective to our office on these interesting issues. So Alessandro comes to us from Carnegie Mellon, and he is a longtime researcher of behavioral economics of privacy and information society, uh, as well as privacy in the online networks. And Christina is a sociologist from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and her most recent book, Islands of Privacy, is an excellent read, and I recommend it to you all. Uh, so the following, um, the process we'll be following for our discussion is a, a presentation from each of them, and then we'll have a discussion uh, amongst ourselves here, and uh, we invite you to uh, use the feedback surveys we've circulated. We've brought, brought back uh, Louise from our uh, consumer privacy consultations from last year uh, as a way to uh, focus our discussion, make some uh, of these issues a little bit more concrete. They're, they're sometimes a bit abstract, and if we can talk about uh, real scenarios with, uh, with a character to focus it, sometimes it makes it easier. So uh, I, I'm sure you're you're very interested in, in uh, knowing about Louise's life. Um, so for the purposes of the video that we're making, I'll, I'll do a, a quick um, explanation of what she's about, and then we'll go on to our presentations. So uh, we've characterized Louise as a stylish 21-year-old college student who likes to meet people and try new things. And she's active online and, and uh, engages in commerce, uh, talks to friends, all of the usual things. Uh, she's, uh, she's in her final year of college, and she's also starting to look for a job. Uh, she's putting herself through school by making jewelry and selling it online, but she also collects specialty comic books and belongs to a, an international group of uh, comic book enthusiasts. So uh, thank you for uh, thinking about Louise as we talk about these uh, subjects, uh, the public-private divide, complicated uh, relationships we all have with technology and trying to uh, navigate in the, the new world before us. So, so I, I'd love to invite Christina to present some, some uh, words on her research. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Colin and Chantel, everybody at the uh, Office of the Privacy Commissioner. I've had a lovely visit so far, and you do such important work. And maybe I'll give you a little bit of background about this research that I've done in order to show you how important it is, at least on the other side of the border, uh, down in the US right now. Um, when I started to do this uh, project, what I wanted to do was understand how, you know, quote, normal people thought about privacy, but even more importantly, how did they do privacy every day? So I was very much interested in the behaviors that people engage in, the decisions they make, what they do every single day in their normal everyday lives in order to um, understand more about this boundary between what's private and public and how people negotiate that. So uh, I received funding from the uh, Research and Development Division of Intel in order to do this work. Um, and a good portion of this work was uh, an interview. And that interview, I approached people and said, I would like between one and two hours of your time uh, to talk to me about privacy and whatever insights that you have about it. So we started these interviews, and uh, one person after another, we would get to the one and a half hour mark, the two hour mark, and I would say, gee, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. I've completed this section of the questionnaire, and uh, we, we should wrap up. And they would say, oh, no, it looks like you have more questions. And I would say, oh, boy, do I have more questions. And they'd say, keep going, keep going. So it would be three hours. Four hours goes by. The secretary has been in and out a couple of times. Um, and they go, OK, OK, we really do have to stop for today. Can you come back next Tuesday? And they would sign up for another. So these interviews that I had intended to ask one to two hours of people's time wound up taking between one and a half and over 17 hours uh, of people's time per interview. Most of them took between eight and nine hours to complete over two or three sessions. So this is a, a topic that individuals find hugely important. And the work that you're doing here as privacy professionals and as citizens of Canada who find this to be a very important aspect of our life is something that is very much shared um, with the people that I did my research on. Um, although I, I have to say that you've made a little bit more progress as a country uh, than we have in, in addressing some of these issues from a policy perspective. Um, so as I said, I was very interested in finding out um, not only what is private, what is public, what does privacy mean to people, um, but I also wanted to know how it is that we actually go about doing it. So in this sample of pretty much middle class, upper middle class individuals living in the Chicago area, um, we went ahead and, and did these lengthy interviews supplemented with ethnographic research and lots of archival stuff, uh, looking at newspaper articles from 1985 through 2006 to get an idea. And overwhelmingly, uh, what I found out privacy means to people in the States is, um, or good privacy anyway, um, people thought, thought that they had good privacy if the things that they wanted to be private were as private as they wanted them to be, which is just wonderful for somebody trying to do policy, right? <laughs> Um, you know, but that was very, very true. Um, you know, it generated just huge piles of transcripts from this, and over and over again, that was the image. And it accounts for such a huge range of behaviors that we see in the states, from people who are, you know, have pinhole cameras and they're tweeting everything in between every place they go, and they're Facebooking constantly, their status is updated every 30 seconds, and you know, um, to people who move off the grid and up a mountaintop and uh, want to completely get lost, maybe sometimes in a bunker in Montana somewhere. Um, all of those people can feel as if they have good privacy because they feel like they're in control of how private different things are in their lives, whether it's their time, their space, an idea they have, a part of their body, um, a piece of information, whatever the, the topic is at hand, 
you can feel as if your privacy is good when you feel like you have control over how private that is and how public. You uh, make it selectively available to other people at very specific times in very specific ways. And this theme of operationalizing privacy as selective concealment and disclosure came up over and over and over again, no matter what I was looking at. So there is a chapter in the book where um, I look at secrets and how people think about and manage secrets and the work of secrecy um, in order to understand the fundamentals of informational privacy. There's a chapter in the book where I look at the contents of people's wallets and purses and I ask them to please take everything out and make two piles, one which was more private and one which was more public, and then explain to me why they put each of these objects into the pile that they did, and proceed from there to understand how it is that individuals manage identity and the objects that represent different parts of their identity in an era where we think about identity theft and related issues so often. Uh, a third chapter in the book looks at information and communication technologies and the sense that these individuals had of being completely overwhelmed by the demands for their attention that come at them every single day through multiple email accounts, multiple telephones, um, all of the, the, the venues through which people have to get a hold of them and how they try to manage that using this system of devices, which is both creating the problem and serving as a means to address the problem for them. And then finally, looking at uh, behaviors in the neighborhood amongst urban neighbors and how they try to affect privacy every day. And these range from what's probably my single favorite question in a book filled with questions. Um, the chapter starts with the, the question, what do you do when the doorbell rings? And uh, absolutely fascinating collection of choreographies that people go through and, and decision trees that people go through when their doorbell rings. Okay, am I expecting anyone? If I am, who could it be? Which doorbell is it? You know, do, Can I look through the curtains and see who it is without them seeing me first so that I don't give away whether I'm home or not? And, uh, uh, fascinating behaviors, and also another collection of fascinating behaviors now in the States, which is about uh, managing trash and selectively deciding what must be shredded, burnt, um, um, waterlogged in some cases, uh, thrown out in the disgusting kitchen trash to prevent people from looking into it, um, and what's really just plain old garbage that you don't care about anymore and you can throw away. So it was a fascinating uh, um, study for me of just kind of everyday attempts by everyday people to try and understand their privacy and protect their privacy um, in these very well-known, very old-fashioned ways. And we can talk in a little bit about how that translates now in the, in the era of social media um, and, and in light of a lot of Alessandro's findings from his research. Uh, but that's pretty much the overview. Thank you. Alessandro. Well, well, <laughs> let, me, let me start by joining uh, Christina in uh, thanking, thanking you for this invitation. Uh, and it, it's great to be here. Um, I'll, uh, I'm delighted to say a few words about my research. And, and I felt that um, a good way to introduce my research would be to, 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 to explain where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, not a behavior economist by training, in the sense that when I came to the United States to do my uh, PhD at Berkeley, uh, I was uh, trained as a formal economist, uh, neoclassical economics. Uh, the belief that uh, co consumers are economic agents who choose uh, rationally, try to maximize uh, utility over time. They either have complete information or if they have to deal with incomplete information, nevertheless, they use all the information available to them efficiently, and therefore they are able to optimally spread uh, consumptions and, and savings over time in order to maximize this uh, utility. And uh, strangely enough, I decided to apply these uh, tools to the study of uh, economics of privacy, um, by which I refer to the 
um, understanding of the trade-offs, the costs and the benefits, as well as the incentives associated with the protection or the revelation and disclosure of personal data, both for the data subject and the data holders. Um, as I was doing this work, which eventually led to my dissertation, however, I started feeling uh, growingly, growingly uh, disappointed uh, or dissatisfied or even disillusioned uh, with many of the uh, assumptions we had to make about uh, uh, individual behavior to make those models work. Uh, first of all, it's really hard to claim that we as real individuals, not as abstract economic agents, are in the process of complete information about uh, what happens to our data. We often don't even know the personal data about us is being gathered. And if we do, we don't really know exactly how it is used and with what consequences. Second, even if we did have absolute, complete, and perfect information about all possible usages and consequences of those usages of our data, we are still bounded in our rationality. I'm using the term bounded rationality uh, in, the, in the way that Herbert Simon, an economist as well as uh, a computer scientist and a psychologist, in the way he started using it 20, 30 years ago, which means that we are not stupid. Uh, we don't do necessarily uh, stupid mistakes, but we are bounded in our rationality in that we don't have an unbounded, unlimited processing power to consider truly all the possible ramifications of each of our actions, which means that when we go online, for instance, and we decide whether or not to use, say, a credit card with a new merchant, we probably use a very simple heuristic, such as, uh, well, so far I purchased things online, nothing bad has happened before, therefore nothing bad will happen this time, rather than really thinking about is this particular merchant uh, trustable or not. And third, even if we do or even if we did have absolute complete information about anything which can happen to our information. And even if we had unbounded processing power, unlimited time in every instance in our daily life in which we have to decide whether to reveal or not to reveal personal information, well, we still would have to face an innate set of problems which behavior economists and behavioral decision researchers have started uncovering in the last 30 to 40 years which we may classify as cognitive or behavioral biases, and which, in a way, bring us off the path of uh, the traditional, theoretically rational decision making, and make us, for instance, uh, suffer from optimism bias. We may be aware that a certain behavior is risky, but you know what? It will happen, the bad things will happen to the other guy, not to us. Or we may realize that a certain behavior is costly, for instance, uh, posting a certain information about yourself uh, could later on lead to embarrassment or maybe even perhaps in extreme scenario to losing a job. But you know what? The cost is later on in time, is distant. While the kick you get from your friends liking, liking, liking on Facebook the information you just revealed is immediate and therefore you choose to gratify your immediate self. So as I moved to CMU, I started working on uh, what I call the behavior economics of privacy. So uh, at CMU, there is a, a great wealth of uh, uh, behavior decision researchers and behavior economists. And so kind of by osmosis, I started learning more of the tools of the trade and I started working on what is predominantly my, my focus, which is uh, uh, experiments with human subjects. And therefore, by experiments, I mean uh, randomized uh, experiments with uh, control conditions uh, aimed at investigating how people really make decisions about uh, their privacy. And to give you some examples, I will uh, uh, briefly mention three studies uh, which cover a span of different years of my research as well as uh, a set of different uh, angles of my research. The first study is uh, the more uh, economically uh, driven and is about the endowment effect um, I've been told that some of you in this room uh, uh, are indeed economists, so the endowment effect for you is uh, not a new term. It refers to a, uh, an effect under which we tend to value more things we have than things we don't. Uh, it has been proven experimentally that uh, subjects, students uh, put in a room for a study, if given a coffee mug, even for a few seconds, will tend to value this coffee mug more than the students who have not possessed uh, being endowed with this mug 
for the same few seconds. And this is important because uh, according to traditional neoclassical economic theory, there should be no difference between the maximum price you're willing to pay for a good and the mean, the, a good which you don't have, and the minimum price that uh, you would accept to give away the same good if you had it. There is an equivalence between these two values, in theory. In practice, there is none. These endowment effect studies have proven now and again that we immediately give more value to something we have. I wanted to see how this applies to privacy and whether it does apply to privacy. Because privacy transactions often come in two forms. One is, uh, do I want to give away my personal information for some kind of reward? And this reward may be tangible. Uh, I get a uh, monetary discount uh, if I use a uh, grocery uh, loyalty card at the checkout, or maybe intangible. Uh, I do a search on Google, I'm revealing something about myself, uh, I'm getting an intangible good, which is uh, my research query uh, returned. Uh, but in other cases, instead, uh, the transactions we do related to our privacy are about uh, buying protection. Do I want to uh, use cash rather than credit card in order not to leave a, a digital trade of my transaction? Do I want to use uh, uh, Tor, uh, an anonymous, anonymous browsing network, kind of evolution of uh, what here a few years ago in, uh, in Canada was uh, the Freedom Network, uh, Zero Knowledge. Do I want to use Tor and therefore experience a delay in my browsing behavior, which is a cost, intangible, but nevertheless a cost, mm -hmm. in order to protect my data? So we wanted to see whether people would assign radically different values to their personal information, depending on whether they were thinking in terms of how much money do I want to give away personal data versus how much money I'm willing to pay to protect my data. And of course, we wanted to set up the experiment in a way that we could really compare the two. Because of course, if you're selling your data, in theory, you want to get as much money as possible. If you're buying protection, you want to pay as little as possible. But we were, we were interested in situations where we would be able to compare the two values. So we went outside a shopping mall in Pittsburgh, and we asked subjects who were just walking by, they are customers of the shopping mall, whether they wanted to participate in a survey. The survey was not sensitive, and in fact, it was a decoy. It was an excuse of no interest whatsoever to us. The real experiment uh, happened at the end of their taking the survey, because we offered them a payment. Unknown to the subject, we had randomized them to different experimental conditions. Some subject immediately received a $10 card, a Visa gift card, so a card that they could use online, offline for any other payment, and they were told that this card was anonymous. This card would not be associated with their actual name, so any transaction done with this card would not be linked to, the, to their identities. To another group of subjects, instead, we gave a $12 card. And these subjects were explained that this card was identified. Any transactions they would have done with this card would be linked to their identities. What happened, however, was that after a few seconds, around 40 to 50 seconds, that each group of subjects received their respective card, either the $10 card anonymous or the $12 card identified, we told them, hey, by the way, there is another card. So to the subjects who first received a $10 card, we told them, hey, there is another card a $12 card. Do you want to swap your $10 anonymous card for a $12 card which is identified? To the other subjects who started with the $12, we sold them, hey, there is another card. Would you like to swap your $12 identify card for a $10 anonymous card? Hmm. So we framed the problem in, for one group as, do you want to get two more dollars to give away your future transaction data? And the other group was, uh, do you want to spend $2 not to give away your future transaction data? However, please note that both group of subjects were facing exactly the same two alternatives. There was no difference whatsoever. All subjects were facing a choice between a $10 card, which was anonymous, and a $12 card, which was not anonymous. Just a psychological framing a, a change, not the actual choices. So according to Traditional neoclassical theory, we should not expect the differences in, uh, in terms of how many subjects would choose the 10 or the 12. In the sense that we cannot predict what, sh what each subject will choose because we cannot at the micro level know what is going on in the mind of that particular subject. There could be an infinite set of reasons to choose one or the other. 
But in the aggregate, with enough subjects in each condition, we would expect the two values, the proportion of subjects choosing one over the other, to be similar. Well, in fact, in subjects, in a group of subjects who started with a $10 card, 52% uh, of them kept that card, and 48 chose to swap to the $12 card. So one out of, one out of two subjects said implicitly, no, I don't want to give you away my future data for $2. My privacy is more important than this. The subjects instead who started from the $12 card, well, of them, only 9% chose to go to the $10 protected card. So here, more than 90% chose to keep that card. Only one out of 10 chose protection. So here we have an example where the choices were the same, but the privacy behavior changes dramatically depending on the frame. If you frame it as the issue of uh, uh, do you want to get more money for your data? Many subjects say, no, my privacy is important, at least one out of two. If you present it as you want to pay for protection of your data, most of the subjects say no. This is important policy ramifications because if you think about it in a way, you have to see, you have to think or figure out whether we as subjects are more in the first condition or in the second condition. What I mean are, in our daily life, do we feel that, do we start from a position of protection, that our data is by default protected and we can decide to give it away, in which case we would value privacy a lot? Or rather, in our daily lives, are we more in the second condition, in which we feel that by default our data is not very much protected and therefore we have to do something, we have to buy back our privacy, in which case most of us will not pay for privacy. And the point is, uh, uh, this was a response to the claim that people don't care for privacy simply because privacy enhancing technologies, such as for instance freedom, network, and zero knowledge, have not been successful in the marketplace. Our point is, maybe there is something more going on, something more complex going on, which refers to the framing that we are immersed in, in terms of protection of our data. And the second study I want to very briefly mention is less uh, behavior economics and probably more behavior decision research or even psychology. We, we call it the illusion of control because it relates to the paradoxical effect that uh, granting control uh, on their personal information to users have on their actual objective risk in terms of self-disclosures. Uh, one of the most common definitions of privacy in the literature is privacy as uh, control or on personal information. And uh, to discuss this, I have to bring in a differentiation that economists often uh, drive between normative models and positive models. A positive model is about the world as it is. A normative model is a, about the world as it should be. And I would claim that the definition of privacy as control is a normative definition, in that intuitively, we want people to have control of their personal information flows. It makes sense. It feels right. It feels ethically correct. And also, it feels like the right way to solve privacy problems. But here is the kick. Maybe it's not always the best way to solve privacy problems. Because in positive terms, in terms of what control really does, there is a possibility that our experiments have suggested that more control paradoxically leads to less privacy. And what do I mean by that? We have done a number of experiments in which we made uh, our subjects feel either more in control on uh, personal information flows or less in control of their personal information flows. At the same time, we were manipulating in the opposite direction the objective risk associated with their disclosures. What I mean is that at the same time as we were giving, making them feel more in control, we were actually increasing the objective risk of those disclosures. In the experimental conditions instead where we were decreasing the control, their perception of control, we were also decreasing the risk. Well, we found out that the behavior, the self-disclosure behavior of the subjects, meaning how willing they were to disclose sensitive information with strangers, was a function of the perceived control, not of the objective risk. Which means that the more they felt in control, the more sensitive information they were revealing to strangers, even though the objective risk uh, were increasing. They were basically revealing more sensitive information to more strangers, and vice versa. The less in control they felt, the less they were revealing. And this is related to uh, a, indirectly related to research in psychology, which has shown that sometimes technologies or policies which are meant to protect us paradoxically increase our risky behavior. Think in terms of seat belts on cars or helmets for motorcycle riders. 
they are good policy meant to protect us, but the paradoxical consequence sometimes can be that people feel more secure and therefore they start taking more risk. And this is what we are finding in the case of privacy. To conclude, this doesn't mean that control is bad. Uh, I like to distinguish not just between normative and positive model, but between necessary and sufficient condition. I see control as a necessary condition for privacy, but not a sufficient one, in that there is, uh, in positive terms, the risk that more control leads to more self-disclosure. And this brings back to the policy issue. The research I'm doing, the reason I'm doing this kind of research is uh, on one side, I'm interested in human behavior, in understanding human behavior. But on the other side is uh, to impact policy. So to try to talk to people like you, which is why I'm so delighted of being here today, because uh, what our results suggest is that, you know, the free market solutions may not necessarily always be the best or the only solution to privacy problems. Thank you Thanks. very much. And it's a challenge for uh, our office as a regulator to hear more control for the individual can actually be undermining to privacy and, and it, uh, uh, it's a challenge for us to try to deal with that sort of result um, when we're um, talking about social networking activities. These things may be structured in a way that actually encourages us to reveal more. Um, so I'm not sure what, uh, what suggestions you have from the uh, sociology perspective, Christina. It has, it, uh, it has a deleterious effect in another way too. And as soon as you mentioned the, the customer loyalty card for the grocery store, I have to share one of my favorite um, responses to this. You, you never underestimate the creativity of people responding to the reward structure at hand. Um, and one woman who I interviewed made it a regular practice to go to this very large grocery store chain that we have in Chicago. And uh, they're known for having these fantastic buys on like huge packages of pork chops and chicken breast and you know diapers and all kinds of things if you use the customer loyalty card. So what this woman would do is that she would separate what was in her cart as she went mm -hmm. through the store. And she pushed everything to the front that would be a fantastic buy if she used the customer loyalty card for it. And then she had all these other groceries in her cart that were not any fantastic buy. There was no discount for it. And she would use her loyalty card for those great bargain items. And then she, in a separate order, using a different, uh, she would use a credit card for the loyalty ones and pay cash for the others. Because as she explained, the store has a right to know how much inventory it's selling it has no right to know who's buying it. So this was her way. And she also made a practice of, uh, she had three different customer loyalty cards for different grocery store chains and would shop at different ones throughout the month using different forms of tender. Um, you know, think about the amount of effort that that requires, <laughs> right? So on the one hand, there's not just the illusion of control, there's the practice of control. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when I asked her, do you think we need to do anything at a policy level to better protect privacy, her response was no. Mm. She had control. She had the illusion mm. of control in what mm -hmm. she was doing. So why would we need to do anything else about it? So there's this other way in which once you find people who are so actively you know, setting their controls on their Facebook account, doing all of these kinds of things to feel as if they've got control and they're exerting control, that also leads to a, a sort of a lack of motivation to address these issues at a higher level, um, maybe through policy, maybe through uh, industry standards, whatever it would happen to be. Um, it, it's a persistent problem. Sure. It's a fascinating story um, because as an economist, it makes me think about the, the concept of marginal cost. The, 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 the marginal cost of protective privacy for me is definitely increasing with the amount of protection you want. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us can do uh, very uh, inexpensive and uh, common sense uh, uh, actions such as, well, in the States, not, put the, not putting your social security number mm -hmm. in, uh, in your CV any longer. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can do less expensive, uh, slightly more expensive, but still not incredibly expensive practices such as maybe shredding 
documents. But then if we start having to do everything to protect our data, we very quickly enter in the, 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 the stage of escalating marginal cost in that we would have continuously to apply this kind of uh, mm -hmm. selecting uh, strategies, not just the checkout of the grocery store, yeah. but in our choice of the mobile phone, how often we use it, whether we even turn it on when we are in a, lo in a location versus the other, what we do online, uh, what we do with uh, item we purchase, which may have RFID cards and so forth. Soon enough, uh, the only way to protect privacy becomes like you know, living in the, on the top of, uh, of the mountain. And even then, you're still not protected because you know companies still have data about you which are trading and transacting. So this is a really, to me, an example of how the problem is, uh, is uh, larger than uh, as larger than other than our own individual behavior. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that we should not take individual initiative. I'm a great believer in privacy technologies, privacy and privacy technologies, but the problem is larger than that. It is, and, and um, there was very much a sense of feeling overwhelmed by that individual privacy burden among the people with whom I spoke, mm -hmm. that they didn't even know how worried they should be about mm -hmm. their privacy on certain counts. They were so um, um, sure that there were things going on out there that they should know about, but they didn't know about. And particularly when it came to their children, mm -hmm. they were very concerned that there were things that they should be doing as a good parent to protect their children's privacy, and they didn't even know what they were. Mm -hmm. So that, that notion of just being overwhelmed. Of, now, there were, there were certain people with whom I spoke um, they just loved the game. And again, these were uh, you know, very, very um, privacy conscious, for the most part, IT guys, um, who it was just definitely made the best man win on everything that they were doing. And, and their lives, and they were all single. Um, <laughs> some of them was bemoaning the fact that he'd been through 11 different email addresses because he'd had 11 different girlfriends. and you know, would have to cast <laughs> off each email address <laughs> he cast off the girlfriend um, in order to protect his privacy. But, you know, I, I don't think it's, you know, we don't have the experimental data to say this. I don't think it was an accident that this was a guy obsessed <laughs> with privacy who'd been through 11 girlfriends who was worried about them stalking him. Um, but, you know, so you, you, there are individuals who seem to take great pleasure at figuring this out and doing everything that they can. But for the most part, the people that I spoke with are just feeling like, wow, mm -hmm. enough. Can't somebody else do something about this? Does it really have to be all up to me? In fact, I even heard uh, of another group, the, the sophisticated people who just give up, precisely because mm -hmm. they, they know that uh, there is a limit to um, uh, what you can do. And uh, it, it reminds me, of a concept studied in, uh, in a different field, patent law, which is called rational ignorance, refers to a situation where you rational decide to remain ignorant. And some of us understand enough about the ability of uh, uh, other entities to track us that we decide to not even, uh, not even try to protect ourselves because we know it's, uh, it's a losing battle. It, you know, that was, a, um, I, I'm thinking about conversations with individuals about uh, serious violations of their privacy. And, and first of all, I, I should explain just a little bit about, it seems very simple, uh, but the model for what constitutes a privacy violation, how does that even happen? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I figured out is that a privacy violation happens when an individual's sense of how private this thing is, is out of sync with how private it actually turns out to be, right? Mm -hmm. It's very simple. And it can be just a little bit out of sync, um, or it can be wildly out of sync, right? Um, an example that I, I use in the book that might be familiar with some of you is you can have an individual, she's got a new boyfriend, nobody knows it's a secret that this is her boyfriend, but she calls up her best friend and she's talking to her best friend on the phone week after week, telling the best friend, oh, I've got this new guy, and here's what we did this week, and then he said this, and, you know, everything's pretty private. She's going along with a sense of, you know, only my boyfriend and I and my girlfriend know about this. But then all of a sudden, 
she finds out that the girlfriend, let's call her Linda Tripp, <laughs> has been recording those conversations, has handed them off to some people in some pretty powerful positions, and the next thing you know, right, that's an example of a privacy violation, which for, you know, Monica Lewinsky, from her perspective, this was a very private thing, which is suddenly, if the internet is forever, nobody is more forever than, than Monica Lewinsky right now, you know. Everything, the contents of her closet, unsent love letters, her, her book buying purchases at Borders, you know, you name it, man. It was dragged out there and stuff that she wound up doing with her boyfriend was plastered all over the universe afterwards, right? So violations can be smaller things that just have practical, small practical consequences that you have to get over. They can be bigger things. People can have radically different responses to exactly the same privacy violation. But again, you have this notion here of, well, just how much in control did you think you were at the time that that happened, which winds up creating um, this huge variation that we see in how people are responding to those mm -hmm. things. And one thing of, of real interest uh, to our office that came out of the uh, consumer privacy consultations last year, and we talked a bit about this this morning, uh, was the issue of the, the public-private divide and how people are managing their reputations mm -hmm. and trying to navigate this, um, this complicated um, life that we have, moving from a student life to a work life to a new job and so on, and trying to keep your, your, um, your leisure interests separate from your professional interests, pro from your uh, professional position as well. And, and that's, uh, that's difficult. There's not a lot of guidance out there, and people are really feeling, I think, on their own. And we're trying to work through that. But do you have any thoughts on that issue? Well, it certainly used to be the case that you could rely on your location in space and time mm -hmm. to help you manage all of that, right? We had this very nicely bureaucratized way that you could engage, OK, work is at this place during this time. Home is at this place during this time. This hobby that I have is at this place at this time. And mobile technologies in particular have completely blurred mm -hmm. those boundaries or created the possibility of completely blurring those boundaries. Um, you know, I look at my college students now and I think about when I went to college, boy, I'm starting to sound old, you know, <laughs> saying stuff like that, you know. But when we went to college, we were really very isolated from our families and from people back home. And, you know, you, you became, you had the opportunity to be a different person, mm -hmm. in part because the people who were anchoring you to your past were not so present. Mm -hmm. And now I've got college students who are constantly getting texts from their family while they're in class. They're, you know, doing, so the, the possibilities of, taking those boundaries for granted, mm -hmm. I think, are gone because mm -hmm. of these technologies. Instead, you have to work harder than ever to put them in place and to manage them. And again, I, I'm seeing some very creative responses to that. Um, in part, uh, I, I don't know about you, but you know, people are coming up with, they use different ringers to tell you who's calling and whether or not they really want to answer that at that moment, depending on who it is. Um, they, they are only admitting certain people to their Facebook account. Um, uh, the, the tweens and the teens I've been talking with who have friended their parents have a very different experience on Facebook than the tweens and the teens who have not friended their parents on Facebook. So mm -hmm. negotiating that and keeping those boundaries in place, those segmented parts of the world, I think has gotten harder. Um, but never underestimate the creativity of this particular primate species. That's what I would say. <laughs> These are very interesting points. Uh, and, and, and your reference to us as a species made may, may me makes me think about a, a, an issue that we have started investigating, which is in, uh, we are very apt and, and good in uh, negotiating these boundaries between public and private in, in, in our offline lives, because we literally evolved millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years to do that. There is an element of physicality 
associated to privacy, which gets lost uh, when we transition from privacy to information privacy, and we, we move from the off offline world to the online world. Think about this example. I if you are in your bedroom and you start undressing, and uh, suddenly you notice that through the window, a neighbor in another house close to yours is looking at you, you immediately, I will bet, uh, feel uh, disturbed, uh, uh, kind of violated, and you probably are going to close the shutters of the window. Yet, you have no problem putting a photo of yourself in bikini or in swimwear on Facebook where thousands of strangers could uh, see the same information, the same photo over and over and over. The absence of the physicality of the other person uh, changes completely the perception of uh, whether this is a privacy invasion or not. So to me, there is something you have to investigate in terms of how our sense of what is private and what is not, which evolved for a physical world, the world of sensorial cues, how can it adapt uh, to a world where these cues are filtered through a computer screen? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and creates all sorts of troubles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there have been studies before showing how people <coughs> misinterpret symbols, uh, trust and security symbols uh, on, uh, on uh, online interfaces because they see them through the eyes of uh, offline interaction mm -hmm. and uh, while in the online world may mean something different, such as, you know, HTTPS uh, means some level of security. Some people feel, oh, it, it also means privacy. Well, not really. It's uh, about uh, protecting your credit card as it travels from the client to the server. Not really does it tell you much about what happens to the credit card number once, once it reaches the server. And we don't seem to be getting a whole lot smarter on this count either. You know, we started out with saying, oh my gosh, this poor teenager in her bedroom, 2 o'clock in the morning, everybody else, the house is quiet and dark, and she's having a private chat with mm -hmm. someone. It's so not private, right? All the signals are telling her this is private and this is just between you. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you got the story, but what was it, a week ago? We have another congressman who mm -hmm. is on the front page of the New York Times you know, his photo of him taking his picture with his shirt off in front of his bathroom mirror so that he can send it, you know, first is Brett Favre and now it's this guy. It's like, you know, when, when are people going to learn that just because it's your private cell phone in your private bathroom that you're now sending out, mm -hmm. you know, that can be dis when are we... We're, we it, just don't seem to be it, getting a whole lot smarter. I heard the story. The, 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 the congressman was even using a uh, email address, an e email account with his actual name. I, I <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the, the intimacy of, of the, the device, right? The, the device is so... And the immediacy as And well. it's immediate. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it, everything about it feels personal, yeah. and, and yet the consequence is so not personal. It's very, I mean, it's, um, there's a message there in terms of designing and, and ambient computing and things are going to disappear uh, even smaller and, and disappearing even. So how are, how are we to be reminded that something is public or be, could become public or could have negative consequences? How, how should we recommend to designers a better way? Well, we, we, we can try uh, and use uh, uh, nudging mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So uh, we start investigating these, uh, these uh, uh, asymmetric uh, or soft paternalistic approaches, which, mm -hmm. which means not just, there, there has been lots of research, of course, on uh, uh, privacy and security usability through the years, uh, and that's great research. Uh, we, we want to push the envelope further uh, in order not simply to make the uh, systems we use more usable uh, for privacy or security, but in fact uh, design them in a way that counter the cognitive biases or behavioral mm -hmm. biases which we may have without limiting individual freedom. That's why these approaches are called soft paternalistic or asymmetrically paternalistic. A, a strong paternalistic approach will be uh, oh, revealing, revealing your date of birth on Facebook is dangerous because it can lead to identity theft. Therefore, we prohibit any revelation, any disclosure of date of birth. That's an approach which is very heavy-handed. Most people would disagree with that approach. A soft paternalistic approach could be anything be from uh, the default settings that even if you reveal your date of birth is private unless you physically go and check, uh, change the uh, initial setting. 
to something like uh, when you reveal, you reveal your date of birth and you're in the United States, a little algorithm based on the paper we did two years ago, immediately tries to credit your social security number, shows it to you on the screen, mm -hmm. you realize uh, the potential implication of revealing, or revealing that information, and then you are free to decide whether you want to go on uh, revealing mm. the information or not. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a new area, but I, I find it promising. Although, once again, I, by in no instant, I believe that this is going to solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the other thing about um, this kind of research, which is so promising, is not only do we know what will work, but we have to get better at using symbols and imagery and metaphors that people understand mm -hmm. from hundreds of thousands of years of face-to-face -face, um, uh, negotiating of privacy so that when you provide that information, it doesn't look like a high school calculus algorithm. It doesn't look like even, you know, the, the I don't know, if you, if you look at the hotel remote control, you know, it can mm -hmm. be an overwhelming and how do you figure. So finding those kinds of local metaphors and local ways of conveying the information in, in instantaneous, self-evident ways drawing from local metaphor that you understand. Um, and I, I have a paper on this. It was very interesting because there was, uh, down in New York, there was a new Prada store that was opened. Um, and they got some very, very glitzy, really smart uh, interaction designers to design the dressing room for this Prada store. And what would happen when you went in to try clothes on was that you would walk down this hallway and they told you, oh, the dressing rooms are down there. And you're walking down and you don't see anything that looks like a dressing room. So people are all like confused about, is this really where the dressing rooms? I think these are offices down here or something. <laughs> and if you go far enough down the hallway, all of a sudden a door swings open. And you go, okay, maybe that's, okay, that's the dressing room. And you go in, and you're standing there, but you have no idea how the door opened. And you have no idea how the door closes, because it's all magic, right? And then as you actually get your confidence up and you change, you find out that it's not just a mirror, a front and back mirror, or a triple mirror. Some ladies' changing rooms have a triple mirror in them. But there's actually a camera taking a picture of what you look like from behind. And it's projecting it onto this space over here that looks like a mirror. So you're seeing, and it's a delay, a little bit of a delay. So you're looking from the front. You're seeing what you looked like from behind, like you know, a second and a half ago. And then you're like, OK, where is that coming from? And, and as you leave, you have people who are like, oh my god, I don't know how to get out of here. How do I even, you know, so they're looking, at, there's a thing on the floor that you have to step on. So here you have this, right, there's a time for cutting edge technology mm -hmm. and for, for fooling around with that. And there's a time when for the sake of privacy and making people feel secure in their experience with it, that you use much more local, much more familiar kinds of, of ways of at least conveying the information about their privacy that they have. Afterwards, you know, people were like, I didn't even think, you know, if they were projecting that, was that being recorded? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, what I looked like from behind <laughs> of all things, you know? Was there a consent form? Yeah. Speaking of which, about privacy policies, and um, you both talked a little bit in your research about information overload people are suffering from. Mm -hmm. How do we communicate with people, and that's a concern for our office, what good models would be for privacy policies? Are we, are we trying to go to visual representations, local sort of stories? How do we best reach people, or how do we recommend that um, organizations move forward in this quick attention uh, um, environment. There has been a, quite a bit of recent work in this area, including but not only limited to um, uh, CMU, mm -hmm. work on standardized privacy notices, for instance. Um, um, I, I, I feel there, there are some very good approaches there, uh, simplifying information, presenting it in a standardized format so that uh, it decreases the cognitive cost uh, for, 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 for the subject of knowing where to look for the information 
how to know what is important and what is not. In the future, maybe there will be privacy policies implementing even more uh, interesting approaches, maybe even video and so forth. But once mm. again, I go back, uh, not to sound gloomy, but I go back to the issue that I see these solutions are, as necessary, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Because we know from plenty of evidence from behavioral decision research that when the problems are problems of uh, lack of insight and lack of uh, control, uh, no matter how much amount of information or awareness you give to the subject, you are not going to change behavior in the manner desired. So uh, I fear that in the worst case scenario, privacy policies, even in their standardized version, become only a way to uh, pretend that we have solved the problem while it's mm. uh, really a way to get rid or s sweep away the problem under, under the rug. The problem remains there. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that um, there's been so much progress made in data visualization techniques, designers who specialize in how to visualize information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have this wonderful calendar mm -hmm. um, out of your office, which I think is like, boom, there it is. There's mm -hmm. the point, and everybody laughs about it. And you remember it mm -hmm. far more than if you have this nice, meaty pamphlet that has you know 10,000 words in it that have been carefully put together. I would have been the one writing the pamphlet, by the way. So you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm allowed to criticize that. Um, and, and cheering on people who have more, um, I think humor matters, actually, but, mm -hmm. but more visual techniques. You know, sometimes um, when I talk with younger individuals who seem to get this way better and way faster than, than the rest of us do, uh, you know, you ask them things like, imagine what your grandmother would look like if she knew that you were doing this right now. And, you know, who's to say that you couldn't actually use that? And when they're about to put something, there's a picture of grandma shocked beyond belief that pops up on the screen and reminds them, you know, ooh, yeah, maybe I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'm going to, you know. Um, and, and something that Alessandra was talking about earlier, too, is that the, the reactions of people who know us and who really matter to us mm -hmm. are the things that drive our behavior far more than the knowledge that some... IT group over at Google, you know, might reach into the cloud and pull stuff together or scrape the data off of this. And these people that you don't care about at all and you're never going to meet are going to know what you're doing and then they're going to sell it to some marketing firm and, you know, maybe a, a ring of Russian identity thefts, you know, or something. I mean, that's the, that might be a little closer, actually, because yeah. we all have images of Russian identity theft rings in our, um, you know, but, but, finding ways that make it meaningful in the ways that these mm -hmm. things are meaningful to us can be extremely mm -hmm. helpful. Mm. I think um, I'd, I'll ask you one more question each and then we'll go to the floor if there are any questions. And that uh, would be, how do you see the privacy debate, debate evolving over the next five years? And what do you see, um, what, what's your optimistic or perhaps less optimistic view of, uh, of how things will will play out in the next few years? Um, I'll present both the optimistic side and the pessimistic, pessimistic side. Um, the pessimistic side is uh, um, that the, the combined trends of uh, uh, growing ability and power in uh, data mining and in our ability to piece together dispersed uh, data from diverse data sets, combined with the increasing self-disclosure mm -hmm. uh, by most of us um, in different outlets, combined in turn with the increasing privacy externality cost, what I was referring to earlier in our uh, first conversation. The privacy externality, I, I use this term to refer to the cost that each of us is bearing if they want to protect privacy in a world where everybody else does not. For example, all your friends are on Facebook and use Facebook to plan a party. If you're not on Facebook, you don't hear about the party. So there is this uh, network externality where it has, if you want to protect your data while everybody else does not, your costs are going to increase. 
So the combined effect of these three forces, data mining, self-disclosure, and privacy externality, uh, doesn't bode well for the future of privacy. Um, and that's the pessimistic side. <laughs> the optimistic side is that uh, maybe we can do something. I'm a strong believer in privacy and technologies. technologies. I do believe that in the last 20, 30 years, to, uh, thanks to encryption and uh, protocols such as blind signature, homomorphic encryption, and so forth, we have developed, uh, we collectively, in the private uh, sector, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, colleges around the United States, Canada, and uh, many other, and, and all the rest of the world, we have developed technologies and protocols to protect pretty much every conceivable electronic transaction so that the transaction can still take place while in some level, in some sense, personal data is being protected. Mm -hmm. That makes me very optimistic. However, I also know that privacy technologies don't work alone, don't work uh, in vitro. They need a, a fertile environment a, uh, to, 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 to prosper. Mm -hmm. And to create that environment, I believe that we need a collective intervention, the intervention of policymakers. It's not something which I'm afraid uh, can come simply from the individual human beings, mm -hmm. uh, from us uh, as uh, disparate users, because as a user now, you cannot even use eCash any longer, for instance. Uh, I'm referring to eCash, to the um, David Shaw blind signature uh, form of eCash, not other non-anonymous eCash which came later on. So the point is, uh, we need a collective intervention, uh, um, uh, policy making intervention, and we need uh, eventually a radical change uh, in uh, the frame of the debate, which is, uh, as, we, as we chatted about earlier, we should move from a, from a debate which is framed on, uh, well, um, we need this data to do these transactions, and uh, if the consumer really can show a real cost of us doing so, then the consumer should prove the cost and maybe we'll do something about it. Mm -hmm. We should move to a new frame of the debate, which is uh, we already have the technologies to do this better, to do everything we are doing now, but in a more privacy-enhancing way, so you, data holder, should prove that why you are not using these privacy enhancing technologies to provide the same service in a more privacy-friendly manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, I think I'm both a little bit more optimistic and a little bit more pessimistic. Um, I, I do think that people are amazingly resourceful at finding ways to make do with what's there. Um, I don't think that we in the states are getting much closer at all to any kind of a comprehensive policy intervention. Um, I, I, I still hear too many people not convinced that it's a problem, mm. um, even though you hear many more voices and find many more tools available to address the problem. So uh, it would be very nice. I, I think that we'll see an increase in the amount of volunteers who are being better at protecting data that they're responsible for and not collecting data that they don't absolutely need in order to get their work done. Um, at the same time, um, I'm more optimistic in the sense that the Facebook generation is going to be coming of age and they are going to be the new IT professionals, they're going to be the new policy makers, mm -hmm. they're going to be the people who have made those mistakes really early in their lives and know what's involved with it, they're already becoming much savvier users of, of social media in some really interesting ways. And uh, we might see them pushing things forward uh, mm -hmm. in a way that my generation doesn't seem to have gotten yet. So both better and worse, I would say. Yes, the, uh, the uh, rules for, you know, um, employers and assessing, you know, wanting to see Facebook pages or wanting to see mm -hmm. maybe that those sort of social cultural rules will evolve to mm -hmm. to deal with the new environment as well. Mm -hmm. So mind you these these as these individuals come of age, they are, you know, the kids who've had Gmail accounts since they were eight. Their whole life is going to be laid out through uh, you know, by the time they they graduate college and mm -hmm. they take jobs and begin careers, you know, there's already going to be 14 years worth of email trail mm -hmm. on them. There's already going to be, there are, are seven and eight year olds with their own Facebook accounts right now, mm -hmm. you know, and some of them are even younger and they dictate to their mom and dad to, you know, update their status for them. And 
moms and dads are starting their Facebook accounts when they're born hmm. and posting stuff for them. So uh, there's going to be a, a traceability. We talk about an electronic footprint, mm -hmm. an electronic biography slash autobiography that is going to be following individuals for a long time by the time they start getting into the workforce. Mm. So I expect that that's going to, to have an effect on mm -hmm. where we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now we have a microphone somewhere here. If there are questions from the floor, um, we need to uh, have people use the microphone if they want to ask questions. Do we have any questions? One at the back. You have to really want to ask your question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I thought it was uh, mobile. <laughs> Stephanie Perrin, University of Toronto. I really enjoyed your presentations. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. First one for Alessandra Kisti. Were you planning on repeating the experiment, which is extremely interesting, on something where people's risk assessment might be different? So for instance, I'm still reeling in shock that in the United States, if you get grants from the Science Foundation and you're doing genetic assays, you have to put the genetic assays online. That would be a perfect one if somebody was going to a medical lab to have some genetic work done and you told them either, you know, two groups, one group, yours is going online, how do you feel, do you still want the test? Second group, yours will be protected. Because I, I wonder if people are just too inured to it to make rational, I, I, mean, I think it's an interesting frame you were building, but would it carry all the way through? I have another question if nobody else is going to ask more questions. Uh, I'll start first. Sure. Uh, um, uh, yes, we want to. We, we want to extend it to, to, to different data types and different conditions. I, I, I presume, of course, you were referring to the first experiment, the gift card yeah. experiment, sir. Uh, in that case, we were testing for reaction to the sensitivity of future uh, purchases. But by the way, the fact that we were focusing on future purchases w was, a, was a feature, not a bug, because we wanted to uh, level the field across all subjects by focusing on a piece of information which at the time of the study doesn't yet exist, which means that all subjects, regardless of the condition, could have gone into the mental accounting of uh, okay, I'm going to get a $10 card, which is anonymous, therefore I'm going to buy Penthouse magazine. Or I'm going to get a $12 card, which is identified, because in any case I want to buy a Big Mac. So we really wanted that. But we want to extend it to different, different data types for sure. We have already started doing that. We went into uh, location data. So testing how whether this endowment effect in privacy takes place also when we talk about uh, can we monitor you for a day or so all, all the places where you go and we found the same effect. We found the same evidence of an endowment effect. We don't know for other data types. So what I would, uh, um, um, well, let me rephrase it. We know hypothetically what happens with other data types. So we chosen data types which were extremely sensitive such as your medical records and what we find in the hypothetical version of the experiment, so in which we ask hypothetically, how would you act? Everybody goes for the protection. Almost everybody says they would uh, not take the additional money. Not just when it's two more dollars. We did it with you know, 10 more dollars, 20 more dollars, if it's about their medical data. But we also know from previous studies that you cannot trust what people claim in hypothetical versions of studies about privacy. So if and ever, CMURB, we allow us to study, uh, to do a study where we actually can get medical data and uh, allegedly revealing it publicly if they don't pay us, then if we, one day we can do the study, I would be very, very curious to see what would happen. I think if I can add on to that, the other thing that uh, interests me about it is that when you broaden it up to be a system of data, right, that it's a week's worth or a month's worth of how you use this credit card which has a thousand dollars on it or something. Um, there are more sensitive, in theory, more sensitive pieces, types of information, but what I found with the people I spoke with is that it's not that single interaction or even if it was a $50 credit card, you know, that they would use throughout the day and maybe make five purchases with it or something. It's really the system. It's looking at this whole thing where you can profile someone 
so much more easily if you have a whole month of what their purchasing looks like. So that's another way of tweaking the experiment that would be fascinating. Very true. And th there is both from us, and I've seen other studies. One was by uh, uh, George Danesis. I'm, I'm sure some of you know his, uh, his beautiful privacy research, where th there is evidence that people do intuitively grasp. As consumer, we grasp this idea that piece of information A and piece of information B, when combined, their added value is more than the two values of A, B alone. However, we also find uh, uh, currently only anecdotal evidence that there is not much scaling effect, that uh, in the sense that if you, if, you, if you go from revealing from one person to two people, uh, there is a big significant change in how concern you are for your personal information, therefore how more you would value your privacy, but it doesn't scale, scale up to if you go from, say, from two to four, <laughs> or from four to eight. It seems that intuitively we, 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 we categorize our privacy concerns in base of whether we reveal to one or to two or too many. We don't really linearly uh, uh, adapt our, our, our value depending on the number of people accessing information, which kind of may make sense uh, in a uh, from, from a certain perspective, why that, why that happens. Stephanie? Can I ask my second one? Sure. Um, the second one, I, you, you both referred to the difference or distinction between the physicality of a physical threat to privacy and the information privacy. And so I'm wondering if either of you have seen any research this wonderful brain research where you find out, out which center of the brain lights up. Uh, it seems logical, given the uh, unexplicable behavior that we have online, that if there's a physical threat, a certain center li uh, lights up, and that that center is not lighting up with these kids online or with anybody else online. I, I do dumb things online, too. I won't restrict it to my kids. Um, anybody done any research? Got uh, any money to do that kind of research? Not that can, I know of. Can I answer by no comment? <laughs> <laughs> because the research may be ongoing, and uh, but it may allegedly may have no result yet. So it's better not to talk about uh, <laughs> things when you still don't have uh, all the all the results out. But I, I f l let me put it this way: I find it a very exciting area. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I only have one question, although I guess this is the two question mic. Um, David Elder Steichman Elliott, I think, and, and I apologize because I may have zoned out for a minute, but I thought I heard as part of the discussion that there's a fundamental problem with uh, privacy policies and that they're not really an answer and that they just kind of sweep things off to the side. And is that because they're so, there's such an administrative burden um, to running through them and they're, they're kind of an annoyance in a way when you have too many data points and choices to make? Um, and so I'm wondering when we talk about things like, like giving a nudge or having grandma's picture pop up, whether we might be in the same boat, um, depending on the number of individual privacy choices we have to make every time we upload a photo or add a story or something. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Mm. I'll start. Uh, um, this, this is another very good question. So the, the, the way I, 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 I try to structure the problem is that Going back to something I mentioned earlier, I see, and I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying, okay, but this is just to kind of present a, a stylized uh, view of what the problem I feel is. There is a problem of incomplete information, not knowing, for instance, how your data will be used. There is a problem of bounded rationality. Uh, there is maybe 15 pages which tell you how the data will be used, and you don't have the time to read them all. Uh, or you don't have the, the education to understand them. There have been studies showing how, uh, what was the la last one, showing that you, you need a median uh, uh, grad level education to understand the average uh, privacy policy. And then there is a problem of uh, behavior and cognitive biases, which means even if you have the information and even if you read it, you may still not act on that, even if it's in your best interest to act on that. We know that it's happening already from other fields, such as uh, telling people uh, how much, how many calories there are in certain foods doesn't necessarily help them making uh, better decisions sometimes in what to eat. Forcing uh, fast food restaurants to reveal 
what kind of ingredients uh, they're using or what kind of what is the percentage of saturated or unsaturated fat does not really change behavior. In some cases, there are changes in behavior, such as forcing restaurants, as it has been done in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in certain places in the United States, to post outside the restaurant the health uh, uh, ranking of the restaurant, whether it got an A for the cleanliness of the establishment, or it got a C, or it got a D. That's very effective, because the information is uh, so simple, A, B, C, D. Everybody knows exactly what it means. It, it, uh, it happens right before you have to make a choice. It's really actionable information. But not all the information given to consumers are truly actionable so easily and so fast. I believe that privacy falls under that category. That's why my point was that there are certain problems uh, that behavior decision researchers consider problems that you cannot solve simply by throwing more information or making the consumer more aware. Because even if in a, an aware and an informed consumer may still do things that the consumer will later regret. So the strong paternalistic solution is stop the consumer from doing that. But strong paternalism is uh, almost universally despised. So the mid, uh, median approach we are trying out is uh, let's try soft paternalistic approaches, which means you don't take away the freedom of the consumer doing as they want, but you add something in the, in the design which nudges the consumer in a certain direction. How you choose a certain direction is another tricky topic. We probably, topic we probably could talk for hours about the ethicality and the scientific grounding of how to choose in which direction to nudge people. Mm -hmm. uh, nudging has been used in areas where there, there is undeniably a better choice, such as is undeniably better for people not to smoke rather than smoke. Uh, it has been used in areas where generally there is a better solution, but not always, such as Usually, it's better that you put money into your 401k, into your you know, retirement saving account, rather than you don't. Usually, because if you started saving right before 2007, maybe you lost half, uh, half your mm -hmm. funding, right? Privacy, ha, such a tricky area, right? Because who are we to say that you should or should not post certain personal information? So there are all ethical issues here. But leaving them for the moment apart, we are trying to explore whether these additional mechanisms don't are not aimed simply at solving the informational or awareness problem. They are aimed at addressing the, the cognitive and behavioral bias problem. So the, they try to act at a different level. I think I want to uh, address that in a, in a different angle, a very different angle, um, getting back at something that we talked about this morning a little bit, which is um, one of the big ahas of this research for me was um, managing privacy is about managing relationships. That privacy is so important to establishing the kind of relationship that you want with any other body, whether it's somebody who sits next to you in the classroom or it's a spammer and you want to completely cut them out of your life, a telemarketer, uh, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, a, a, a child molester. You know, there are certain categories of people that come up over and over again when you ask uh, folks who do they want nothing to do with and they, they want to keep them very far away. Um, but privacy isn't just integral to managing relationships with others. It's also so important for managing your relationship with yourself and who you are and who you want to be and what you can think about and how creativity for many people, it can come from moments when you're collaborating with others and there's this wonderful give and take coming. But creativity often, almost always, also involves alone time when you can think things through and you can be piecing them together in ways. So I think that one of the reasons that policies about privacy don't get traction is because we're not really talking about what it is that privacy does for us. Why should we value it? We keep talking about all these bad things that might happen to you, what you should be so afraid of if you give up this piece of data or something, but maybe we need to flip that on its head and talk about the value of privacy, not only for yourself, but also when you gift it to others. What are you giving them? Um, uniformly, uh, there are individuals who deserve no privacy, 
according to my research. They are convicted child molesters. They are, you know, uh, convicted felons, people who are in prison. Um, if you look at our system in the United States, they're people who are financially indigent. If you're on public assistance right away, you deserve to be surveilled and, and have everything that you're doing uh, subject. You know, when we think about what it means to um, have this very Orwellian presence in your life, we associate that with individuals who have proven that they are not trustworthy. I include in there very young children who can't be left alone because you can't trust them to, to not hurt themselves and not do stupid stuff, right? They just don't know. And then as a child gets older and they prove their trustworthiness, we grant them more and more privacy. We grant them more and more personhood, humanity, which we associate with privacy. And so, you know, privacy policy schmolicy at some level, you know, what's that got to do with anything? Maybe we need to be talking more. And, and it's very interesting because it's very difficult. Secrets, for instance, are the most private of our private things. Of all of the private information that we have out there and that we depend on other people to either have good manners and not ask us about it or be so caught up in their own life they don't ask us about it, right? We get privacy in a lot of ways that we don't have to work for it. Um, but in some ways we have to work for it. And we work for it with secrets because that's information that really matters to us. And when you ask people about secrets, the first thing they think of is bad stuff. You know, if it was good, it wouldn't have to be secret. You know, well, phooey, what about Santa Claus? You know, what about surprise parties? What about, you know, things that are, you, when I ask people the stuff that's most sacred to them, it's not even the stuff that they're ashamed of. It's these secret dreams and fantasies that they have for what they might do one day. It's, it's a middle-aged woman saying that she still dreams of being Pat Benatar up on a stage, you know, and would die if anybody knew that, you know, that's such a secret. So, you know, privacy, secrecy, these are things that I think either people don't really think about what their value is, except in being free from some unknown threat that might happen to them, or they think of them as negative things. You know, if you didn't have anything to hide, then you wouldn't need privacy kind of thing. Well, baloney. For the human condition, we need it. We rely on it. As much as we rely on connection and, and being public and publicity, putting stuff out there, it, it's hugely important to who we are. And maybe the policies that we have aren't sticking because we don't have a more concerted effort to have a conversation about why those policies matter, you know, what they are a response to, and how they are an attempt to defend the right of human beings to dignity. And then if we want this very old piece of sociology, 1967, I think, American Journal of Sociology, where Barry Schwartz argues that the only way that society can interface smoothly with each other in public is if we promise each other these little islands of privacy where we are away and out of each other's faces and entitled to explore and have and be those things that you just don't want to be put out there in front of everyone. It's a very different kind of answer, but somehow I think it, it might be related. Thank you. Uh, is there, oh, Madame Bernier. Yes, for the benefit of our Francophone audience, I will ask my question in French and then I'll repeat it in English. I would like to go back to this polarization that we did before between optimism and pessimism to say that uh, I have the feeling when I listen to you that is very optimistic and I'd like to hear you on this but why am I optimistic because I have the feeling that uh, the fundamental values that are in the private life are not changed and we are just in a transition stage, uh, limited in time, uh, what I hear from Christina is, is a con confirmation that I, we know intuitively that 
private life is the control of what is known about us. What I hear from Alessandro is that this control is, in fact, easily manipulated. What I hear also is that we can have a standardized way, a normalized way, to manage this manipulation and ensure this control to diminish the intrusion and protect privacy. This makes me uh, believe that we are at this moment in a situation that is limited in time, uh, or maybe to go back to Stephanie Perrin, the brain, the human brain is not as advanced as the technology is. It's, it's um, catching up to technology. So to say that, uh, and it may be because the two presentations are so remarkably good, I feel very optimistic. Perhaps they've just put me in a very good mood. But perhaps most importantly, I think that they have given us some reasons to be optimistic. And I'd like to validate this uh, impression I have. I'd like to hear you on it. So I hear from you, Christina, the confirmation that intuitively we know, but that privacy is about controlling what is disclosed about you. And I'll hear from Alessandro that this control is easy to manipulate. And therefore, we need to make sure that we empower individuals to control what is known about them, and that we have a normative framework to ensure that that control is protected. What I also hear from you is that we may be in a time warp whereby we want to exercise this control, but technology is ahead of us that we are fooled by the lack of physicality, that we are fooled by the complexity, by we are fooled by the unprecedented di dimension of the diffusion. But that we could very well wake up. You were saying, Christina, the Facebook generation are, is going to mature and become the adults that actually will know exactly how risky this is. And Alessandro also was pointing to this evolution where society is reacting to ensuring this control. So I'd like to hear you on that. You both said you were partly pessimistic and partly optimistic. But how do you feel about me being optimistic? Because I believe that we as individuals will remain unchanged in our attachment to privacy because it is inherent and fundamental, but we will change in relation to how well we understand the new platforms and the new risks. Uh, Madam, I think you put it so well. I don't know that I want to say anything afterwards. <laughs> um, um, but but as, as you uh, were summarizing this so well, I, I was reminded of some of my respondents who grew up in very small towns. Um, even though everybody that I spoke with is pretty much middle class, upper middle class, uh, it's a little deceptive because many of them came from much humbler roots, uh, maybe rural Appalachian homes. A number of them were raised in the projects on public assistance in Chicago. And a number of people were from very small towns. And when you talk to people who are from very small towns, they understand in a way that other people don't how focused everybody is on what you're doing and how hard you might have to work to prevent everybody from knowing what you're doing. And the, the suffocating effect that that can have on you if you want to try to invent yourself, reinvent yourself, explore be someone other than who you have been from the moment that you arrived in that small town, in that house. I think that's the analogy for the Facebook generation. I think that they are the equivalent of having grown up in a small town, and they've learned very quickly, in a very hard way, um, what it means to have everybody know what you're doing all the time and how restrictive that can be. So I see them already, experienced users. That is, people, um, and at some point I'll have to define what I mean by an experienced user. But for now, I would say um, probably they've been on Facebook for about three or four years um, and very dedicated to it. And those individuals, I think, are extremely aware of what this means. And they've gotten very good 
at using social media as one piece of how they put information out there, one way in which they do things. So uh, the idea that they have 650 friends, which I think my daughter has something like 654 friends or something like that, it's a performance. They all know it. It's exactly what it is. She's not putting anything out there that she doesn't want everybody to know. But holy cow, I have the bills to show how many text messages she's sending every day, how much time she's spending on her cell phone, even more privately, with individuals. And she's learned how to do this whole thing. Um, and then, you know, the privacy of a cup of coffee in a coffee shop versus in her dorm room with somebody down the hall. They've gotten very, very savvy, very fast at understanding how to control, how to selectively conceal and reveal. Um, and that's part of my optimism, uh, you know, embedded very much in your question. And it goes right back to those people who were raised in small towns and who get it in a way that people who were raised in the city maybe don't. It takes them longer. I, um, yes, I also do uh, share um, some of your reasons for optimism. Uh, and in particular, in particular, I will start from something you were mentioning near the, the end of your question, which relates to human nature. And I do believe that um, it is part of our innate uh, needs and desires to, to have moments for privacy, to have some private sphere. Uh, there have been some who have suggested that privacy is a modern invention. I do not believe that, to be correct. I do instead agree with uh, Alan Westing research, which has uh, highlighted uh, uh, needs and forms and shapes of privacy across culture and across the history. I believe that technology is not changing that. Technology does not change human nature, although it does affect uh, behavior. At the same time, in our nature, there is also the need for publicity, uh, the need for disclosure. And it seems to me that technology at the moment is uh, pushing, influencing most uh, our need for disclosure than uh, our need for privacy. So in a way, we are like uh, back in the 1960s when we built faster and faster cars, uh, but the technologies for protection, the seat belt and the ABS were only in their infancy and were not even mandatory. So in a way, perhaps uh, using the car industry as an analogy, we are now developing better ABS uh, and uh, better seat belts through privacy and technologies but we should make them more mandatory in, uh, in some form so that these uh, faster cars that we have built, the Facebook, uh, the Twitter, the blogs, can also be better controlled by the driver, which is uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, one more. Do you notice any changes in the way people, or differences in the way people are defining or uh, seeking to value or protect information in their personal life versus their professional life? Uh, and do you see any changes in the way people are defining uh, the work self versus the personal self with the emergence of more social networking technologies? I have to say that I haven't, um, a long time ago I, I did a book on how people think about home and work and their home and work selves and, and how they manage the boundary between those things. Um, you know, you, you're asking for right, a, a time analysis, a time series approach to this to say, what was it like before and how is it different now? Um, and I haven't done that research. I don't know. I can say that in general, people have in general, opportunities to blend those things now in ways that they did not have available to them before. That it has become much, much easier to let those different parts of you blur together. To have your, your boss call you when you're in the middle of what is clearly a, a home-related or a hobby-related um, um, opportunity. Well, you know, there's a place in the book where I had to quote this one uh, article that I found reporting that um, I think it was up to 22% of the people polled in, in one country reported interrupting a sex act to answer a ringing cellular device. 
um, you know, so we have opportunities now <laughs> to respond to demands for our attention pretty much anywhere we are, pretty much no matter what we're doing because of these mobile devices. And so I think that that does indeed create more opportunities for people to have to face that and have to set those boundaries if they want to. In general, we see the same thing happening, though, uh, mm -hmm. that we saw when television came around. And suddenly, people were gathered together from different demographics in the same living room watching the same program, right? So you have kids and parents all watching TV together, which started blurring their identities and blurring uh, the social worlds and their social references in ways that didn't happen before. Just as if you suddenly have unisex hair salons, right? Whereas before it was there were hair salons only for women and there were, you know, barber shops for men and never the twain shall meet. Well, now all of a sudden everybody knows everything about what's involved in, um, you know, coloring your hair, cutting your hair, frosting your hair, um, anything else that you could possibly want done at a hair salon because they're all watching it together. And we see that same blurring of worlds and blurring of identities now, I think, uh, or certainly the opportunity for it now that you have these ringing devices in your pocket or pocketbook that you carry with you everywhere. Do you want to? No, I, I, I have nothing to add to what uh, Christina so eloquently said because I found this a absolutely fascinating question and in fact a fascinating research question. Not having data to answer the question, I cannot, mm -hmm. I cannot add more than this, but I, 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 I do believe that the key in answering the question is about how our professional and personal life for all of us, I believe, are blurring because of technology. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could add to that, the, the sociological perspective on technology um, has always been that technology gives us opportunities to discover fundamental things about social living that we may have been taking for granted for a long time. So technology is just this wonderful entry point into finding stuff that, well, you know, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, we certainly had to figure out how home and work identities were going to come together and what people were going to do. At the time that telecommuting became possible, w many people had to reface that, right? So that with each wave of technology, it just provides an opportunity for us to, to now look at stuff that we've taken for granted and say, ah, oh, that was totally artificial, that way that we managed our home self and our work self and our hobby self and our parent self and our child self and our, you know, all these other things that we do. That was totally artificial. We just discovered that again, and we've got to come up with a new response to it. So that's the, the fascinating thing about new technologies in, in my field. No, Barb. Um, oh, OK, sorry. Um, the newest scare right now is uh, geotagging with pictures taken from smartphones. And I was just wondering, where do you see, as a sociologist and as an economist, uh, where this issue can actually go in, in the future and its possible ramification on privacy as a whole and privacy as um, policies. Um, so the, the geotagging uh, issue, uh, okay, I'm going to give an answer which is only a partial answer. I, 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 I hope you, you, you allow me to do so, which is, um, I got interested in the ge indirectly in the geotagging because of uh, uh, websites such as uh, uh, Please Rob Me and uh, I, I Stalk You, .com, which were getting um, uh, maybe Twitter updates and photos and getting geographic information from the from the photo and uh, establishing whether the person, for instance, was not at home and so forth. And I started wondering whether. Uh, there is some uh, a quantifiable uh, effect uh, of that information on uh, criminals' behavior, whether criminals ever really started paying attention to that. Um, I didn't find the data sets to test the hypothesis that criminals have started using actually you know, Twitter updates or Facebook uh, status updates uh, for um, their offline criminal activities. There has been anecdotal evidence of that, but it's very hard or close to impossible right now to find 
hard evidence. Uh, but they did find something else in the process of thinking about this problem. We found uh, a, 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 an incident where it has in uh, um, late 2008, early 2009, a Memphis, Tennessee newspaper uh, published the uh, names and addresses of uh, gun permit owners for all the state of Tennessee, causing pretty uh, negative reaction by the NRA and you know, gun rights um, advocates and so forth, which paradoxically, paradoxically brought even more attention to, to the online database, uh, which pushed the database from uh, five uh, page views per day on average before the NRA got onto the news to uh, close to more than half a million page views in uh, February 2009. And we were wondering whether this publication of the uh, names and addresses of gun permit owners had had any impact of some form on uh, offline crime. So we were interested whether there was uh, any evidence that uh, criminals, and not just cyber criminals, if it started using online information for offline crimes. So we downloaded the database itself. Uh, then we, we downloaded the crime data at the street level for the city of Memphis, Tennessee, for, if I remember correctly, 15 weeks prior and 50 weeks uh, following the publication and publicization of the database. And we started looking for changes using econometric techniques, changes in uh, uh, certain crime rates as function of the density of gun uh, permit ownership. And uh, what we found is that most crimes did not exhibit any statistically significant change before and after the publication. One crime did, and the crime which did was were burglaries. We found that burglaries uh, went statistically significantly up uh, relative to uh, a baseline uh, uh, zip code in the zip codes with uh, lower than median gun density. It went statistically significantly down in uh, zip codes with higher than median gun density, which was uh, interesting. And, uh, and it may suggest that out there, uh, criminals, uh, not just teenagers, are, st are becoming more and more apt to using Web 2.0. Maybe also criminals are becoming even more apt to using Web 2.0 technologies as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think also that as, as soon as um, any privacy advocates hear about something like this and, and start going, oh my god, oh my god, don't they realize that could you know lead to X, Y, and Z? Um, I have friends all up and down the coast of California who are going, woo, we could make a game using this and, you know, now everybody will know exactly where I am and we get back to this, this same issue over and over again of, you know, kind of one person's privacy nightmare is another person's publicity dream come true. And, um, you know, we, we saw the same thing. It, it's not the same issue, but I do have to talk about Google Street View just a little bit. Um, because as much as people were and are absolutely delighted with a Google Satellite View and being able to you know, pinpoint a house anywhere in the world and tell what season the photo was taken and you know, um, use all of this information to, to track down all kinds of interesting things and, and show stuff to people. Um, Google Street View had a very mixed reception once people started finding out about it. And, you know, the, the thing about Street View is that there were shots um, of uh, photographic shots into people's houses, right, from the street. And you could see uh, in this one very famous case that went ahead, um, you know, this woman's cat was sitting in the picture window for the house. You could tell where the, the curtains were, what was located. And, and there were a lot of people who said, you know, what's the big deal? Google Street View, it shows your cat in the, in the window. And so, well, let's pull that back to the ages old interpretation of what that means. Now, if you were there in your house, and somebody was standing out on the street staring and staring and staring in your house, a stranger, right, you would respond to that. 
any primate would respond to that. Staring is an aggressive act, it's threatening, you know, MRIs would be, you know, our brains would be going doop, 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 you know, this is, this is a problem. And you would respond to it, um, you know, depending on who you are, you might call the cops, you might call a neighbor, you might grab your gun and go out and say move right along, you know, depending on, on your perspective on that. But here it's been captured and it's posted there for anybody in the world to now be that person, that stranger on the street staring into your home at your cat and your curtains. And it felt like such a different thing. So the inventors and the people who are, are using Street View and think it's the best tool in the universe, that's one <coughs> response to it. The other response is, this is such an intrusive act for you to do that and post that. And is it Germany that's actually outlawed Street View, right? They, they've cut it from, what, what did they do in response to it? I can't remember. Does anybody know what Ger Germany was? A whole home, but not a commercial uh, uh, building. Is that correct? And, and, and Google agreed to, to take that down. With the paradox that if you call yourself out, you are going to attract even more attention on yourself. Right. So why is this house cut out of the picture? Right. What, do you, what do you have to write? You know, which, which always, the, the absence of information is sometimes, you know, the curiosity of our species is incredible. And sometimes when you've got all this information there and there's one thing missing, I'll never forget this one guy who carried in his wallet he had this huge wallet. He had to leave our interview because he had to go to the chiropractor. And I found out at the end of the interview, he sat like this through the whole interview until we got to the, oh, what's in your wallet? And he takes it out and it's this big thing. And like, it's like, oh, it was incredible. And one of the things he had in his wallet was a photo of his mother and himself and some missing person who was cut out of the photo. And that was the woman who he proposed to, who turned him down, and he joined the army the next day. So here he is 45 years later, and he's still carrying this photo. And believe me, the absence of her, it's the first thing that you ask about in, in that photo. So it might be exactly the same situation. With, you're looking at Google Street View, and oh, there's this you know, missing house here. And it's not like in Harry Potter where the house pulls apart, you know. Yeah. Just, uh, nope, there's an empty house there. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Barb? Hopefully this is on. Okay. Um, Alessandro, you mentioned necessary but not sufficient. Um, is sufficient, in your view, privacy enhancing technologies? That's one part of my question. And the other is, because of what we do at the Privacy Commissioner's Office, where we investigate complaints against organizations or, or we review PIAs, and we say, OK, why don't you do X, Y, or Z? That would be much more privacy enhancing. Well, it has an effect on their business model. So when you're dealing with the Facebooks and the Twitters and Google and so forth, who have constructed what they do really out of personal data, what's in it for them? And that's the struggle that we have constantly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so um, Kenneth Loudon uh, is an is economist at NYU. In 1996, uh, this uh, seminal paper on uh, markets and privacy was discussing what he called a co-regulatory uh, co solution to privacy, which I I, I strongly believe in, he suggests a combination of market forces, technology, and regulation. So that's why I'm saying information alone uh, is not sufficient. Even technology alone is not sufficient. In a sense, the technology, just putting out a great technology out there doesn't imply that the technology will be adopted. If, there are, if we are stuck in uh, a, uh, maybe in a, in a virtual circle where uh, the technology may improve uh, once adopted, everybody's welfare, but somehow 
you need that bootstrapping, you need the kick to, to, to get into the implementation. So that's why I don't see technology alone as sufficient, but I, 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 I do agree with Kenneth Loudon, we need a core regulatory approach, and that's why I feel policymakers have such a crucial role in this. As to the issue of the, the data holders or data service companies, I, I will make two points. One is that as an economy, economist, I would urge the debate to differentiate between fixed cost and, and, uh, and variable cost. Um, there, there will be undeniable fixed cost uh, due to transitioning from how we do things now to uh, doing things with more privacy protection. We have to change legacy application. We have to move uh, our server from A to B. We have to retrain uh, users. We have to retrain uh, our workforce. We have to rewrite manuals and so forth. But those fixed costs, uh, in ideally, uh, have not to be born again. The variable cost, the cost of doing business, uh, the cost of transactions may perhaps increase, perhaps remain the same, perhaps even decrease. For instance, there have been uh, suggestions that uh, e-cash technologies could have decreased fraud relative to credit card transactions because paradoxically, and I'm, once again I'm referring to David Chaum uh, e-cash anonymous payments, they, at the same time as they protect identity, they allow for authentication to be much stronger than with current credit cards. Why? Because with current credit cards, you share with the merchant all the information necessary then to impersonate you somewhere else, which means that if the database is broken in, someone else can then use the credit card information. With eCash, for instance, you don't, because the way blind signatures work is that no one has access to your private key and yet you can, uh, um, you can use it for payment. So it's an example to show that when uh, the data holders respond to you, well, it's costly, well, you should investigate whether are they talking about uh, the transition cost to the new state, or are they talking about really increasing the variable cost of doing daily business. I would argue that most of the privacy and technology costs are the, are the former, not the latter. Uh, and finally, what is in for them? Well, I would actually twist around uh, the question. And I'll go back to my claim, per perhaps a little bit of a provocation, that perhaps we need to twist around the privacy debate, uh, twist completely, the change the frame of the debate from, from where it is now, where the consumer is supposed to prove that there are huge costs uh, to him or her if privacy is not protected, to a situation where instead the data holders should prove that they have no other way of doing their business than uh, in an intrusive way. There is enough technology for them to use that consumer data can be protected while they, are, while they do business. And this may lead uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps as to be investigated, to a more fair and equitable allocation of, uh, of the profits, which at the end of the day come out from the usage of consumer data. Okay, well, I will thank our lovely speakers for coming to Ottawa today on such a wonderful weather day. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that, um, but uh, we're very happy to have had you come and spend, uh, spend a full day with us. And we're looking forward to your, your papers that you will write, and we will post on the website for, uh, for you all. It, they should be, um, they'll be short opinion papers as we, uh, as we go through the series, we'll be posting those. And uh, please fill out the feedback forms that you have. We didn't talk about Louise a whole lot today, but um, certainly the examples that we had in the feedback form are, uh, relate to a lot of what we spoke about. I just wanted to mention um, the next in our series, uh, we will have Adam Greenfield and Azar Raskin coming to talk about uh, incorporating privacy into design. Um, we also have on um, uh, March 15th coming up, we have a PIA workshop in the morning for, these are for federal government um, people only, uh, PIA workshop, and then also um, a sort of a, a privacy practices forum where we'll be sharing uh, ideas and, and practices uh, across departments, so we're looking forward to that. Um, we have the, uh, the new um, year for the contributions program, that's our research and public education program, 
So please check uh, online for that because we're looking forward to your proposals. And uh, finally, we have um, the privacy camp on March 19th at Ryerson at, in Toronto. Um, we're a, a main sponsor of that event. So uh, look for that and, uh, and thank you very much for coming today.